Hello, everyone. We are going to um, get started here in just a minute. I'm kind of watching our participant count, uh, giving up people an opportunity to get logged in here, and then we will begin. Hope everyone is doing good today on this Thursday. We're one day closer to the weekend, which is awesome. And we're super excited that you joined us today for, I feel like a really important and hot topic. So we are excited to present some information and get some engagement and involvement from you all as well. We're gonna get started here in just a second. Again, we're just giving time for everybody to get logged in. Um, to Zoom. All right. That number is starting to slow down. So I think we will go ahead and get started just for the sake of time. Um, we know everyone is busy which is another reason why we're happy you joined um, us today and the National Health Career Association for our Bridging the Classroom to Practice Gap, How to Best Prepare Students for the Reality of Healthcare. Um, are you looking for ways to help your healthcare students bridge the gap between classroom learning and clinical practice? This is a really important piece when we talk about the applicability of skills and competencies. Many health science instructors are finding that there is a growing gap between what students learn in the classroom and what they need to be successful in the clinical setting or how they apply that information. In our webinar today, we're going to explore the reasons why this gap exists, um, talk about some actionable steps that will help you close this gap, and also discuss the importance of fostering a culture of competence, collaboration, and patient-centered health in, in healthcare. Go to the next slide. So here is our agenda for today's session. We are gonna discuss what the classroom uh, to practice gap is. Um, as educators, it's important to understand what this gap is, why it, why it exists, and um, so we can effectively manage and change our teaching strategies to support more effective learning. If we understand the gap, gap and how it exists, then we can provide solutions that deliver on um, being able to produce knowledge, skills, and more effective practice within healthcare professionals. We're also going to look at um, why this gap matters and why it's important for us to close this gap. So to best prepare students to perform in the, in the workplace, it's key to identify the impacts that can result from the inability to transfer knowledge to practice. Of course, the biggest things that come to mind is you know, medication errors or other errors in um, care being provided by individuals that um, don't have the necessary skills. So our ultimate goal is to improve patient safety. Closing the classroom to practice gap can also influence our work culture, professional development, and inequality in career opportunities. So um, we will also share three um, actionable steps to close the classroom to practice gap. And then using research and findings, we'll share some real world examples from our guest speakers, which I'll introduce in just a second, that will discuss best techniques that educators and healthcare employers or facilitators can immediately implement to help close that gap so that um, we have more successful healthcare students and professionals. And I love this um, because it kind of supports why we're here and why we're doing this. So we know health, health science professions are really based on the theory and art of providing care. And um, in reality, this has become the biggest challenge that we are facing within healthcare education. And that's heavily documented in um, nursing research, but is applicable across um, even entry level health science and other healthcare educational programs. So now to meet 
who is going uh, to be chatting with you today. Um, so my name, hopefully many of you recognize um, myself. I'm Jessica Langley Lepp. I'm a clinician by trade um, with tenure as a health science education leader. So we've been, I've been in the trenches. Every one of our panel members uh, today has been in the trenches alongside of you as a health science educator and leader. Um, I've held national certifications for over 25 years. And I support NHA and our partners um, by working on state and national level initiatives that help influence allied health education, training, certification, acceptance, and regulation throughout the country. Um, I've also enjoyed working alongside physicians and other healthcare professionals and, of course, educators, um, and am committed to guiding, enhancing, um, guiding and enhancing learning certification and the level of quality care that individuals can provide. Next, I'm going to introduce Kelly Cobb, who is a product implementation specialist at NHA. Um, she is a seasoned specialist with a diverse background in both nursing and allied health education as well. Um, she has experience across simulation, hospital, academic, and CTE settings, and is dedicated to advancing competency-based learning. Her impactful consulting and advocacy for shared resources have elevated the healthcare education uh, community. And in this upcoming webinar, she'll draw on her extensive experience to share some key strategies for bridging the theory to practice gap in healthcare education. So we hope you enjo enjoy this insightful session with this industry leader. And lastly, we have joining us is Sherry Giles. She is an Associate Director of Nursing Education and an aspiring doctoral scholar with a focus on healthcare education. Sherry's multifaceted experience in, nurse educa in nursing education has positioned her at the forefront of building cohesion between theoretical learning and practical application, specifically in the nursing space. In her previous role as a director of clinical simulation, she pioneered aligning academic content with clinical standards, enhancing the quality of allied health and nursing education. In her current leadership position, Sherry's innovative teaching methodologies continue to, to shape student success. Her doctoral pursuits underscore her dedication to evolving nursing education and supporting fellow educators. With a unique blend of hands-on experience, scholarly insight, and a commitment to strengthening the link between academic concepts and clinical skills in nursing and allied health, I think you guys are gonna love hearing from Sherry today and her enlightening perspective on the topic. So as you can see, um, two really great uh, subject matter experts joining us today to kick off our webinar. I will be facilitating throughout this presentation. There will be a few opportunities for individuals to um, submit answers to questions. Um, we'll look through those and hopefully um, be able to read some of them and, and bring them into the conversation. So please feel free to interact via the chat. Um, and I am gonna throw it over to Kelly to get us started. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to uh, participate in this discussion today. It's something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, so I'm ready to get right into it. So I think the best thing for us to do is to start off with what exactly is the classroom to theory practice gap? And the uh, definition that we have here is a practice gap is a discrepancy found between what students learn in the classroom setting and competent performance, what they can then actually put into practice. And what we typically see when there is a gap is learners do not know what is important they learned everything was important. Uh, learners do not use active learning to practice skills. And then learners are unable to, when it is necessary, ultimately perform those skills. So next we want to explore why does this gap exist? One, we need to change. You know, we've always done it this way. This is why uh, we, we find these gaps. Content overload. There's a lot to learn in saving lives. 
Then we have need to know versus nice to know and even nuts to know. Unfortunately, the, everything is included often in our textbooks. Uh, because there's a lack of experience, students think everything is equally important. The traditional textbooks, as I've said, um, do cont uh, contain quite a bit of information, and they simply do not know without guidance really what they should be focusing on. Death by PowerPoint. I've definitely been guilty of this, uh, having 300 slide PowerPoints and size 12 font. I don't do that anymore, but when I started out as a new educator, I, I certainly did do that. Learning is passive. You know, traditionally we think of uh, the sage on the stage. You have your instructor, you have your lecturer, professor at the front of the classroom, and you have your students sitting in their their desk, uh, listening, taking notes, and, and that type of thing. And then learning is not contextualized to the clinical practice. It's not situated to the bedside. Uh, memorization versus comprehension, they may be able to, I think Sherry often would use this expression, uh, cram and dump. Um, and I know as a learner, I was certainly guilty of that. I might perform well on a test because I had memorized the, the correct answers, but then ultimately I had new information that I had to learn. And so I, I didn't retain any of the information in a meaningful way. And then again, a poor linkage between what I learned in the textbook and then how it would actually be provided, provided in practice. And then focus on task oriented versus critical thinking or problem solving or even task oriented versus patient oriented. So some of the potential impacts that we have when this happens is, you know, poor patient outcomes. Um, when you have your theory to practice gap, um, they have untimely care, decreased quality of care, and as Jessica mentioned, uh, potential errors, uh, a failure to respond. Then uh, they have a trust and lack of confidence in themselves, imposter syndrome, lack of trust in each other, uh, employers lack trust. They want to ensure that the candidates that they're hiring are actually competent and bedside ready. And then ultimately lack of trust by patients and the public. Um, this also affects mental health and well-being. Um, you know, being confident in what you're doing every day when you show up to work. Nobody wants to, you know, potentially harm uh, patients and everyone wants to be of help to their teammates. Um, this affects pride, anxiety, uh, self-esteem, job dissatisfaction. They may be, um, you know, fearful that they're going to lose their job. They're going to make a bad mistake. Uh, and growth. So then we have to consider what are the different levels of learning. And I think it's always good to look at Bloom's taxonomy because there are different levels of learning. Our, our first and lowest level of learning is remembering. And often that's where the learning stops. Your lowest level of learning is remembering. So that's when you're just simply memorizing. Um, some descriptors of that would be defining, duplicating, again, memorizing, recall, repeat, restate. Can the learner recall information? So examples of that would be things that you can get through like flashcards, maybe uh, you might think of like medical terminology, recall. Uh, and it's definitely important that you're able to memorize content so you can then bring it back. But we wouldn't want our learning to stop uh, just there. Next, you have your level of understanding, which would be 
can we take the information that we learned and we're able to recall and then understand how it actually works? So an example of that would be like your AMP. So I've learned what the structures are. Now I know how they work. And I hope that makes sense. And uh, Sherry is always good at uh, understanding these different levels here. So our next level where we really want to be is when we look at the theory to practice gap, can we apply content? This is where you can take information. We know what the structures of the heart are. We know what blood pressure is. Now we know how to do our vital signs. Now we know how to get an accurate blood pressure. Um, now we know how to obtain an EKG. And I, I hope this is making sense to people. Examples of that would be information that you would learn, such as through Skills Builder, Personability. These are some of the products that we have that uh, situate this type of learning. And one thing that I really appreciate is about our products is even with our AMP and medical terminology, they include case studies. So in order to really understand these type of things and how it's situated to the bedside, you have to look at these things as they relate to patients with health alterations. How would they actually see this in practice? So I know how to get a correct blood pressure. Now, what am I going to do if it's incorrect now? How do I need to respond? I'm sorry to interrupt. Sure. So for uh, students to understand the inflammation is students are experiential learners. So the fundamental process that enables students to learn through doing, learning and experiencing is where they're going to get that here at this applying level. So they're going to learn the information in the classroom through that remembering and hopefully that understanding level. But the application level is where you're going to meet that theory to practice gap, taking that things like the case studies and simulation and applying them in the classroom in what they're learning at that time. And so it's not necessarily just surface learning where they need to be. They need to take that a step further and apply it and analyze it. How would they actually see it? Great. So this is our target and where we really want to be. And, you know, if we're spending all of our time in the classroom, you know, just teaching information, teaching information, and they're not having the, app, the opportunity to make decisions and to apply it, we're never, we're going to continually have this gap. Uh, Blooms goes on to describe some further higher levels of understanding. Um, Sherry is really good about facilitating this with her learners. And this is where, you know, they, they take this content and they themselves begin creating learning opportunities. So next we have uh, our process of development from a novice learner to an advanced beginner, competent, and then ultimately proficient and even expert. So some tips for, uh, for getting us to this level here, our competent and proficient, proficient level, are engaging students actively, incorporating interactive teaching methods um, like group discussions, again, as we talked about, case studies, hands-on activities to encourage that active learning and critical thinking. Uh, providing practical experiences, offering internships, simulations, clinical placements, where they get the opportunity to, you know, apply those skills that they've learned in the classroom. Uh, fostering mentorship, aligning your curriculum with real world needs. So ensure that your curriculum is refle reflecting current trends and demands. Um, emphasizing critical thinking skills, promoting problem solving, 
and then continuously, continuously assess and provide feedback. You know, for adult learners, there's two things that we've really got to do. We've got to provide them with one, relevance. Is this something that they're really going to see in practice? And two, feedback. Giving them the relevance, the opportunity to apply it, and then ultimately feedback. Sherry, would you agree? I agree. And one of the ways that we can do that is making sure that we are situating the content that we're giving them to what they're going to see in the clinical setting. Some descriptors uh, that you'll find in the differences here from novice to proficient. Your, your novice, they have no professional experience. Uh, they don't know what they don't know. They consider everything at the same level of importance. And that's really why they need you um, as instructors, as preceptors to help guide on the side. Um, your beginner, they begin to be able to learn how to perform those skills with repeated reinforcement. They can perform single task at a time. However, they're not able to prioritize and they're focused solely on their self and the skill that they're doing. When they then move up to competent, they can perform their skills well. Um, often they're still task oriented. Um, sometimes you, they can multitask, but when we get to this proficient level, this is where they begin to see the big picture. They can move from being task oriented then to being client oriented and patient oriented. So have you guys encountered situations where your learners found it challenging to apply their classroom knowledge in real world settings? You know, you've gone over this content and, and you're like, we went over this. What what's happened? <laughs> yes, can feel free to provide some examples in the chat if you want. And I'm sure Kelly and Sherry can provide their own experiences here as well. Would you like to provide any uh, examples? Yeah, um, we actually just recently came across one where we um, had a, our checkoffs for blood pressures. Our students went through, we learned what the blood pressures were, we learned how to do it, but actually going into the community and having maybe somebody of a larger um, content or somebody who has uh, restrictions on mobility, stuff like that. How do you take the information that you learned and apply it in a classroom, in, in a practical setting um, with the knowledge that you have? And it became a difficult situation whenever some of our students didn't quite apply the information that we had told them um, in getting those blood pressures when we did do our um, community outreach. I, I think that's such a good example. I've certainly saw that too, um, both with uh, CTE students and uh, honestly, I, probably even with myself, if I could remember that far that far ago. Uh, but you know, in the in the skills lab, often we're learning how to do those things on our peers who are you know healthy. Um, if you're doing, uh, for instance, venipuncture, we've got the perfect mannequin arms with uh, the the water hose veins that that anybody could <laughs> could could access and uh, get a blood return on. Um, however, when you have patients with health alterations, then it's a little bit different. So having those opportunities to see not just the steps and the tasks that you're doing, but then how do you do it when you have patients that have health alterations? We also have students who really just struggle on the very basics of care. How do you communicate with your patients? How do you go from talking to this mannequin to, in the skills lab to going and talking to somebody in real life? And it's just those very basic skills that sometimes we miss on. Yeah. And you know, Sherry, I remember when you and I first started out teaching skills, um, often we thought, it, because everybody thought this, 
we had to teach all of the skills before they then had the opportunity to participate in externship or, or clinicals. And we later found that really it was better to stair step those skills. Yeah. So start off with communication, um, letting those students do a, a life review on a client, that type of thing, then learning how to do vital signs and learning in uh, using those skills as a stair step and increasing in their responsibility instead of expecting them to learn everything in skills and then be able to, to go out and do everything. <laughs> We have to learn soft skills and hard skills. It's not just enough to memorize the sequence on a checkoff. Um, you also have to be able to apply that in a real world situation. And sometimes that's hard for students to grasp. Yeah. And, you know, I've heard those soft skills lately identified as really crucial skills because knowing how to communicate with your clients, with your teammates is is really a crucial thing to be able to do. We call it a soft skill, but it's not so easy for some. <laughs> and we're hearing a lot in the chat that that's one of the major areas that they feel like are lacking. Um, and then I also wanted to read one comment that says, you know, we can we can do all sorts of simulations and and even incorporate technology like mannequins and, and things like that to learn right the skill but it's never the same situation and you can't recreate having that direct patient encounter so they may be the most confident knowledgeable skilled person in the world and to this this um, individual's point they freeze up when they get out in an actual setting if they haven't you know if it's an un uncharted territory for them so I think that's something to keep in mind as we continue to add technology into the classroom and we love simulations and it does help to validate that competency, but it's switching that over and actually doing it in, in the real work setting is, is as important too. I think that's why it's very important that we create these what if scenarios. We can bring in what we've seen ourselves in clinical practice and apply that in situations when we are teaching them at the bedside. Right. So, you know, how would this be different? You know, uh, you have maybe you've learned how to do um, again. I'll go back to the vena puncture, right? You've you've learned how to do a perfect vena puncture. Now, what would you do if the client was also on a blood thinner, right? right? What would you do if they were MPO, as many of them are prior to surgery, or you know, what if they were sick? They were dehydrated, so. Yes, I think those what if scenarios are, but, you know, to to the participants um, comment, you, you really can't prepare for just everything. Um, preparation is key, but yes, having those opportunities to engage in real life is just just golden. Um, of course, we know that the more practice they can have, the better prepared they're going to be. So uh, this is also an example here of uh, competency-based learning and development. Um, this is a, a model that they use frequently in uh, learning. And I just put some of our products just because they were they're easy for me to speak to. So uh, I've got one column here, which is the how. And you can see this, think back uh, to our earlier things that we had talked about in regards to Bloom's taxonomy, right? Uh, also the novice to, to proficient um, practitioner. So when you're first starting out, you may have the how, right? Uh, where we start off with memorizing content or um, getting some of that basic information. At this level, they know. Right. And you could even put in uh, an area here for uh, CTE with exploration, like those principles of health science classes and, and that type of thing, or you could put nose of. So they're learning about the professions here when we're learning 
uh, content, what are, what are the best practices and how do we do these things, these things, this is the knowing level. Next, you've got where you, they're actually performing the skills. Um, you know, they're looking at patient videos, formative quizzes, um, case studies, job shadowing. This knows how. So they're learning how to act. They themselves are learn, learning how to actually do these things and getting that feedback, that formative feedback. Your next level would be then shows. They can show what that they what they have learned through maybe practice exams, um, their clinicals, their competency based skills. Then our next level is does they actually and and I just put a uh, medical assistant here but really this could be anything this could be nursing this could be EKG phlebotomy uh, billing and coding but we're here we're doing it, right we've gotten our certification we're actually doing it and then our highest level when we are competent right is we're trusted um but, you know, when you're doing that competency based learning and assessment in your programs, your learner is going to be trusted, right? Your pro program is going to be trusted, your school, your facility. Does this make sense? I, I hope this is resonating uh, with some folks. I know for me, when I first saw uh, this theory of competency here, it really resonated with me. Okay, so how does NHL, NHA help build this bridge, this gap? One, we have that just right content that's attacking the infobesity. Um, identifies what is most important. How are we doing that to get that just right content? We do that through our job task analysis. So our tests are based upon, and I, I know the National uh, Nursing Board exam is also based upon a job task analysis. So are we teaching what the industry is saying is important? Um, and then ultimately, are we focusing on that? Just that, nothing more and nothing less so that they have those opportunities to do that active learning because we're not focusing our time on everything. By reducing that content overload, your learners then have the opportunity to retain and um, uh, access that information. And again, it allows more time for active learning. You're, you're never going to have the opportunity to do those active learning things in the classroom when you're teaching everything. Um, and then ultimately, design and integration of standard clinical competencies. So for, for those of you guys um, in our audience who are developing training materials, do you face those challenges? I, you know, as I talked about earlier, when I first started out as a as an instructor, I certainly faced challenges of condensing content. As a matter of fact, I put in too much content, <laughs> and I I thought that that was the right thing to do. Um, do you guys find that you struggle with condensing your content to what are the essential elements? And then do you want to do more active learning when you're with your learners, but you find you're running out of time? Um, and what do you think is the most common reasons? I know, Kelly, whenever I first started, I definitely um, tried to fit in everything, the nice to know, the need to know, and the nuts to know information. And that made it very difficult to then apply the information that I just taught my students. We just did surface learning um, to begin with. And it was hard for students to then take that material to the clinical setting and be competent at it. 
Yeah, I, I definitely did that. Um, you know, sometimes I would include things that I thought they were important because I had seen it in my own practice, forgetting I'm here to teach people to be comp beginning competent, you know, practitioners. <laughs> and some of those obscure things that I had saw were, were actually obscure because they're not common. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a struggle for most novice educators, no matter whether it's nursing or what you're teaching. Jessica, are you are you seeing any comments in our uh, chat about that? Um, yes. So I think most people <laughs> do struggle, right, with how do I know um, or identify what is the most important information to share. And they're also sharing, how do I fit that into the different lengths of time that the program may be offered, right? A medical assisting program, maybe a 12-week program, a 16-week program, a year-long program. Um, so how do you make those adjustments accordingly? Um, they also talk about, um, let's see, they talked about, um, so if you have interactive or online content, and you assign that ahead of time um, using different techniques to make sure that they're actually reading through the content. We've all had those students that, you know, didn't ever read the textbooks and you expected them to come, you know, to the session with the background knowledge. And then you were so you're moving past that first level right of the no and you're focusing on do you understand what you've looked at and what does it mean? Are you struggling? Um, and they're having to go back and, and put more time into that no category versus being able to move forward and having the extra times to focus on the clinical skills. Right. So good. We've got some tips and tricks for that in our uh, upcoming slides here. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad to hear that because these are definitely things that uh, we have struggled with as well. And we, we've got some information to help you with that. So here are some uh actionable things that you can do. One, align your curriculum with content to a national certification test plan. And if I was you, I would be uh, selecting a test plan that was based upon a job task analysis. So what does the industry say is most important, right? What are the most common things that they need competent beginning practitioners to know. That really will give you just a ton of insight into actually what is important. Um, use a resource that's competency-based. Uh, if it's competency-based, it's not going to be frivolous. This is information that they need to know. Uh, and then use a resource that's going to provide you with data and reporting to one, identify those gaps, but to, to someone's point, uh, to also ascertain, particularly if you have these things available through online learning, can I track how much time they're in there? Okay, next is, again, determine what content is most important. So in addition to aligning your curriculum to a, a certification exam that's based upon a job task analysis, I think probably our most important things that we can think of is just when, you know, for any activity that you're doing, ask yourself these questions. And I know if you're a practitioner, you, this this is going to resonate with you. Would the information improve patient outcomes? Would knowing it help your patient get better? And then consequently, would not knowing it potentially harm them? Is it something that they have to do frequently? And is it something that they're going to have to know urgently? They would not have time to simply go and look it up. Asking yourself these questions will give you so much insight into helping you know what is important. What, what can I maybe not spend as much time talking about in class today or expecting my, my students to regurgitate on a quiz or an exam? And what do we really need to focus on and, and make sure that they know and understand?
And then three, expand, expand your general teaching um, ta tactics and learning techniques. So focus on those scenario-based learning, um, case study, active learning templates. I'm going to provide you guys an example of this. Skills competency checklist, critical thinking activities. Um, if you have the opportunity, provide them with um, that time to reflect on their performance, to get feedback, and then consider your different learning styles. Are you trying to create content that meets every single learning style, right? Or are you trying to, you know, provide them with learning resources that is going to meet not just one, but all? Uh, I, I think sometimes we can maybe focus too much attention in making something that's um, visual based, auditory based, um, tactile based, when if we created things that hit all of these topics, we'd solve for 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 one through all. It, I hope that uh, makes sense. So here's an example of aligning your curriculum, right, to um, a, a test plan that is based upon a job task analysis. This is an, ex is an example of one of our test plans. So you'll see in the test plans, typically what they're going to have are test domains. And here, here are a few of our test domains. So you can see there's clinical patient care over 54%. Actually, I think it's a little bit higher now. Um, is direct clinical care. And I would hope that that's what we are teaching, right? It's further separated into general patient care, infection control, testing, phlebotomy, EKG, patient care and coordination, administrative assisting, communication and customer service. These are all application level learning. Are you guys seeing that? So when you look at the breakdown, you can see, well, what should I be focusing my attentions on? Does that make sense? Then further, when you're aligning your curriculum, you want to then ask yourself, well, how am I going to teach this, right? Am I going to teach it, you know, through PowerPoints? Am I, you know, how exactly am I going to facilitate this learning to help close this practice to theory gap? So this is an example of looking at your test plan and then determining what am I going to use to facilitate this learning. And this is these are some of the products that we have for this. Um, we have our skills builder clinical that covers all, all of these activities here, including foundational or didactic content, along with that competency based um, and then, as others had said, mentioning the, the soft skills, we have our personal ability, um, principles of health coaching. So that's an example of aligning your curriculum. This is a, an example of a learning and development design for just our most of our uh, modules. They will start off with the module overview. Then we have our patient experience coach. And those are typically like three to four minute videos where they have a patient come on and, and talk about what is their experience whenever they're, they're having their blood drawn, right? When, whenever they're having their blood pressure taken. So it helps move them away from in the very beginning in this as how does this relate to our patient? Um, then they have a framing case study. So I really like that in that when they teach these skills, they're not, they are situating it to the bedside. Um, then they get into uh, doing the skill, the step-by-step -step instruction with the video demonstrations that have checklists that go right along with it. Um, and then they come back and offer those opportunities for reflection and then getting that feedback. They're able to do those tasks and get feedback in a, a psychologically safe environment. So 
not just definitions, but situating it to the bedside and allowing them opportunities to practice and make decisions. So again, to the audience, do, do you believe that your learners consistently receive standardized skills, instruction, and assessment from their preceptors? Or, or even their instructors. I know Sherry and I have taught skills and uh, often we would find um, that one instructor would be, be doing it this way and another instructor would be doing it that way. Uh, and certainly at clinicals, we would see that. Uh, we would have students that would come back and say, you know, you taught us how to, to do it this way in the in the skills lab, but my, my uh, my preceptor today, you know, they don't wear gloves when they're when they're doing blood draws, for instance. Um, so if not, where do you see those inconsistencies and how do you currently ensure that they're standardized methods of instruction and assessment? Yeah, one of the things that we do, Kelly, is we um, have our students make a list of things that they see in the clinical setting, and we bring it back to the classroom for discussion. Okay, so why is this good? Why is this okay? Or why should we kind of approach this in a different manner than what we would? We, you know, tell them there is a uh, testing way of doing things, and then there's a real world application of the way that is maybe okay for you to deviate sometimes. I think that's a really good um, technique to do. Also, they can talk about what is what is absolutely not okay to do. You know, I, I know we've said that before. Some, sometimes it's an opportunity to learn what not to do. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> I'm hearing so I, had just like a, I had a good one in the uh, comments. Um, they do team huddles, just like um, in a clinic, right? When, when they start the day or end the day. Um, so that all their instructors are on the same um, page and can see the differences. Um, I think standardized competencies is another way to help get consistency. Um, that is, if if not all the instructors or all the different programs are using the same, you know, learning resources, maybe just the standardized competencies would help. Right. I love those team huddles. So this is an example of some of the active or application-based learning uh, that we that we have. Uh, we have our MA Skills Builder Administrative and our MA Skills Builder Clinical. And um, with our administrative, we have uh, our modules that have 25 of those front office skills competencies um, with like billing and coding, which can often be difficult to uh, standardized through competency-based. Um, with our clinical, uh, they, we have 39 technical skills uh, with those competency-based assessments. And, and you'll see some examples of that uh, later on in this presentation. Additionally, what I like about these two um, products is that they also provide that didactic instruction uh, just prior to our skills module. So they cover some of that foundational content and then they go straight into the clinical skills. Next is the personability. And this is our, again, moving it from task oriented to person oriented. And, you know, even with our, uh, our skills here, this is situated as it applies to our patient because they have those patient experience coaches and those case studies. I appreciate that so much. Next, they have the principles of health coaching, which also has some immersive activities. And I really kind of like to think of principles of health coaching as being uh, our connector in between administrative and clinical because they definitely demonstrate how you, you need to help that client access uh, resources, whether it's, um, you know, within the community, um, behavioral, um, motivating, um, interviewing, and, and that type of thing. So it's definitely, not only is it active learning, but again, and I, I know I'm probably saying this ad nauseum, 
but it's situated to the bedside and patient oriented. This is an example, example of our competency-based assessment. And what I appreciate about this, one, we have standardized instruction. So <laughs> we're not getting inconsistent results, but also this goes step by step with a video. So, you know, I, I've done this before where you pull up a video, give your students these checklists, right? And they're checking off the person in the video. So, and then we might stop too and talk about, well, why are we doing this? Um, so it's that principle of see one, do one, and, you know, even teach one. So they're getting a good standard set of an expectation of how we need to do this and why. I like that they provide rationales for uh, some of these. And then now they're getting to practice on each other and their ultimate final checkoffs. This is an example of uh, some of our pacing guides. This is uh, where we've got someone who is using both the clinical plus and personability. Uh, we give some little information, tips, and suggestions about where things are located in just one document here. We talk about uh, the recommended learner times and uh, note these as being, hey, this is foundational content. And where does this align with the person ability that you might teach this at the same time? Um, and again, it's you, you've got your flexible schedule. This provides you with the information, but you can certainly set your, your own timing on this. And, and it's situated with that step-by-step -step clinical demonstrations and those practice-driven scenarios. This is an example here of uh, the administrative plus where we've got the foundational or what you might think of as a classroom lecture or didactic content over administrative uh, medical assisting, then going straight into those skills with those different uh, competency checklists that they have for that. And what I like about these, the administrative, is that they're the immersive training. They take in a client who truly has some health alteration and then has to um, have these activities done. This is an example of our clinical uh, plus. And this is where you can see that they're starting off with maybe patient screenings and then our skills. What, what's included with a patient screening? What do we need to do here? We've got clinical communication, which is the patient interview and even telehealth. Then going into our patient screening, our didactic content, what does that include? That would be things like your vital signs. Next is your pharmacology. And another tick uh, or tip that you guys can do or a trick is align like content and move from simple to complex. Uh, I know Sherry and I used to do this when we first started teaching because we, we didn't have control of our own curriculum, we had to teach everything in cardiac or everything in skills. Uh, I'm sorry, in skin. Sherry, do you remember that? Yes, I do. <laughs> so one thing that we started doing when we eventually gained that autonomy to set our own um, curriculum is we situated light content together right? So for instance, you might do vital signs. And when you do vital signs, let's look at med term as it relates cardio and respiratory, as it relates to these tasks. Then later on, let's go back and revisit that with a deeper dive when we do our EKG through AMP with the heart 
and respiratory. Does that make sense? I, I don't know if we're having any, any chatter. I, unfortunately, I can't see the, uh, but furthermore, something that we did is that we might, over here in the notes section, we might, if they were doing their externship, we might then say, hey, in clinical, we want you to select what are the five most common disease processes that you see your clients having that are related to cardiac or maybe even related to respiratory? And then what are the three most common test diagnostics? What are the three to five most common medications? And then, you know, if we come down here, so we might do respiratory here in clinical. And then here we might do cardiac. So Just some a uh, time, Kelly, because we're getting close to time. time. Uh huh. I'm gonna have you okay. kind of run through these. Um, go on to the next couple of slides, if you don't mind. Pass this. Sure. I think this content is super relevant based on everybody's chat. It's definitely um, an issue that um, we're all dealing with. Um, again, you guys will get copies of the presentation. So those additional examples that we didn't get to you'll be able to look at and have access to that as well. Um, if you go to the next slide, yes. So on this, um, we are also gonna be sending you um, access or you have a link here that you can see will get you um, access to this cool infographic that kind of summarizes the whole presentation. Um, so um, that will, you guys all have access to that and we can send it out as well post meeting, it'll be included in the messaging. And then also, if you go to the next one, the next slide, um, as always, just for being here, oh, go back up one, sorry. Just for joining us today, we um, would appreciate if you could take a couple of minutes to um, use the link that's here on your screen to complete just a really quick survey. Um, and then we'll draw for a $50 Amazon gift card um, out of all of those who completed the survey. So that would be awesome to use in your classrooms or just for yourself. Um, we hope that you guys have really enjoyed today's session um, and I hope it's applicable and always feel free to reach out to NHA if you have questions, um, comments or feedback for us. And hopefully you will join us for our next topic. So we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Everybody stay safe. And thank you for all that you guys do every day for educating the next generation of healthcare professionals. We're grateful for you all. Hang in there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.